this talk is a report of um, a study that's currently going on at BYU. I say currently going on, so I'm going to begin with a disclaimer. We're only three months into this data. The results are likely to be different um, you know, six months from now, and then maybe different again 12 months from now. It's like I've never done this before. Maybe if I spoke at a conference now and then I could figure out how this works. Um, anyway, so take everything that I say today with a grain of salt. In fact, I've gone so far as to license these slides, no derives, and to put a big disclaimer at the bottom saying mid-project report results not final, just so that later this doesn't start floating around and people don't start taking it apart and saying this is the way it actually works. This is an interim report of an ongoing study. So a few words about the broader context of open courseware. Um, just to start off, if you think about the arguments historically of why people got involved in open courseware, certainly in the case of uh, MIT, we, we, MIT wanted to maintain the reputation as innovators, being innovative and out on the forefront. Many of the schools that came on right after that came on because they wanted to be associated with innovators and loved seeing the name of their university in the Chronicle next to MIT. Um, and at some level, everybody loves the idea of providing a great service to the public, which if you can tap, you know, a million dollars of uh, foundation money to do that, that's good for you as well. But if you take all these historical arguments and think about who the audience for each of them is, the audience for each of these arguments in terms of providing a public good or maintaining a reputation as an innovator or something else, the, the people that you're targeting with that are not on campus, they're off campus. So they're not actually part of your core um, part of your core audience. The audience is off campus, the funding comes from off campus, and so the whole thing is kind of dissociated from what your core business is that's going on. So when the funding's from off campus and the audience is off campus and then the climate changes and funding starts to dry up that was coming from off campus, and your on campus funding doesn't just dry up, but you get a 20% retroactive budget cut at the end of the year, um, then you start or I start to ask myself questions like, is this whole enterprise just completely unsustainable given the assumptions we've come into it with? More recently, people have argued it in different ways. We've tried to argue it um, in the state of Utah as a um, direct benefit to taxpayers. People pay all this tax money that goes into the higher education system and they get no direct return back. And if we had a little extra money to take the courses that faculty produce and make them available to the public, then the taxpaying public would actually get something out of higher ed instead of just the 60 or 75,000 students that actually formally enroll. So in 07, 08, we got a one-time $200,000 appropriation for the Utah Open Courseware Alliance. Um, cable's been about 10 times as successful as uh, we were in Washington there. I think the number you said yesterday is 2.2 million, is that right? 2.25. 225. Um, and that's 9, t that's 9 10 or 10, 11? 9-11, okay, so it's over two years. Um, but still, even with this kind of money coming in to support open course, where you see we're still talking about an audience that is um, off campus. It's the taxpaying public. It's not our core audience, not our primary business that we're focusing on. And in both of our cases, this is a one-time appropriation. I think you have some goal of ongoing, right? It is ongoing money. It is ongoing money. After 11, there will be more, for sure. Unless the legislature takes it away, the assumption oh. The assumption is it's ongoing. Well, they, they'd have to go in and purposely take, that take it out. So again, with the focus being people off campus and people who aren't our actual core audience, and in our case, one-time money, um, and your money, I'm going to say, if it could be taken away, then who knows what, you know, what the economy continues to do. I, is it unsustainable? So as many of you will guess, I'm a fan of openness and would like to see these things be sustainable and last longer rather than shorter. So um, we're doing a study inside BYU independent study now, um, asking some questions about how, and, and I don't want to set this up as generalizing to everyone else in the room because you all have unique things about your institutions. We said, what can we leverage about BYU and what's unique about it in the way that its independent study program does things to, you know, to see can we make it sustainable here. And in fact, I want to argue that BYU independent study is actually a best possible case scenario, as it turns out. Um, if, if, if it can ever be done anywhere, 
BYU independent study should be able to do it. And let me, let me explain why. Um, so BYU's distance education program uh, offers university and high school courses that are uh, paid enrollment courses that either give you credit or show up on a high school transcript. But they also have some personal enrichment courses which are free uh, for people to take, but they're not openly licensed, and that's not what we're talking about. There's about 600 courses in the catalog, roughly evenly split up across uh, high school and university level courses. And BYU Independent Study does about 150,000 enrollments a year. So it's smaller than the Open U of the UK, but it, it's comparable uh, in size. It's, it's a it's quite large operation. About 10 years ago, BYU Independent Study made the decision that in order to keep the costs down for students that took these courses, they're going to stop writing courses to textbooks like online would say, okay, this week go read chapter one. And instead they would actually produce all the content themselves and put it online so that after paying $400 tuition to take an online course, you didn't have to go drop another 150 on a textbook. Um, so we don't write courses to textbooks. They create content complete online courses and BYU owns all the IP. They either write everything themselves or they go hire students for a project to go take photography or, or do whatever. So all the content's there and BYU owns all the IP so you begin to see why this is a best possible case scenario for doing this kind of experiment. Um, also, independent study is a distance offering. They do still offer paper-based distance courses but the majority of people enroll in online now. Uh, I'll come to that in just a second. But these courses are designed to be delivered at a distance. They're really designed to be delivered online, although we do still account um, for paper. But it's not like taking materials out of a classroom and kind of throwing them on the web. It's sharing stuff that was originally meant to be a complete learning experience delivered at a distance. And because they do some paper and some online, um, the content is created and stored as XML so that it can be piped into multiple formats, whether it needs to go to paper or go to HTML. And then um, fi finally, BYU Independent Study is financially independent from the rest of the university. It, it is a um, eat what you kill environment, if you will. So that there is no subsidy, there's no funding from anywhere else. And when we first started talking about openness and open content and thing 10 years ago when I was at BYU the first time, um, the question from independent study immediately was, well, wouldn't this kill our program? If we gave away all of our content, wouldn't people stop enrolling in the courses? And since there is no subsidy that we receive, wouldn't we just put ourselves out of business by doing this? This would be a very foolish thing for us to do. Um, so that question, which is a perfectly valid question, hung unanswered for 10 years and consequently nothing happened for 10 years. Um, but recently, um, we've made some progress convincing them that, convincing uh, people who care about whether independent study lives or dies, which includes myself, that preliminary evidence would suggest no. If you heard John's talk yesterday about the effect of openly publishing books, the relationship between that and sales of books. Um, and as we dug around some more, there's been I, I wouldn't call it uh, research, but there's been some back-of-the-envelope kind of calculations done at a, a couple of other schools. So OUUK uh, says in an email that I got when I asked them this question, about 2% of their enrollments last year came through click-to-enroll conversions for over the last two years on their open courseware. So somebody's there looking at it and thinks, gosh, I'd like to take this for credit, and they click a button. And now that open courseware user becomes a paying customer of the program. Um, so they know what they've gained through that channel, but there's not a measurement of did we, act, did we lose any enrollments because we started giving anything away. And no kind of ROI or cost benefit analysis that's been done there. Uh, the Dutch Open University uh, by email responded saying about 18% of OCW users were inspired to purchase an academic course. Um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what that means, but this is what they said in, in response to queries. And again, there hasn't been any attempt to measure if there's been any loss of enrollment due to the open offering and, and not a look at uh, return on investment kind of things. And at UC Irvine, 
that have a, a, a slightly different model, where on their open courseware pages, there is a click to enroll button. But when you do that, what you actually do is you go to kind of a lead generation page where you fill out information about yourself that goes into a database and then they contact you about wouldn't you like to take this course or we'd like to offer you this course. Um, which they say has so far has resulted over two years in about 84 students and 60,000 in revenue. Um, but again, no measurement of have we lost enrollment by giving stuff away and, and no looking at ROI. And these are all very, the email exchanges are, oh gosh, yeah, um, I, you know, I bet I can find that out for you. Give me a couple days. And then s something comes back saying, you know, I, actually it looks like it's about 84 students and 60 grand in revenue or something. So we said um, the, the timing was very, uh, I work at BYU, so I get to say providential, that uh, I, I came to BYU at about the same time that the new director of BYU Independent Study was finishing his program in instructional psych and tech and needed a dissertation topic. And so we became good friends quickly and said, let's do a pretty carefully controlled experiment where we measure the costs, we look at enrollment on impact, and we do a ROI sustainability kind of piece looking at this to see if, if open publishing would kill BYU independent study if it was done at a large scale or if it wouldn't even be noticed or what the effect would actually be. And let's put some data behind this instead of just being worried. So with lots of uh, permission given uh, very graciously, actually, all the way up and down the administrative chain. We have a pilot now at ocw.byu.edu with these six courses. So three university courses, personal finance, cooking in the home, and public speaking. And some of these are high enrolling, some are low enrolling, one's a medium kind of sized enrolling course. And then three high school courses, uh, government, world geography, and earth science. And government is actually John Mott's class, who I said was giving the better talk down the hall right now. We'll see video of him here in a minute. So, so this is exam an example of what uh, some content from the Earth Science course looks like. Um, here is a video. The, the audio is really not super important, but this is some audio from the financial literacy course. Have you checked out the new basketball shoes that came out last week? They make last year's shoes look so totally lame, which is why I would never be Okay, so that, that's about kind of controlling your desires and impulses and financial planning and things like that, a little video. Uh, this is a video of... Uh, now we're standing outside the Supreme Court chamber. you notice as you look inside the chamber that there are seats for five justices. As on all appeals courts, there is a panel of judges rather than just one judge who presides over the court. You'll notice that in this chamber... Okay. There Etc. So th this is some of, the, some of the content from these courses that, that have been opened. So what does it cost to open a course? This is the one result that is not preliminary. This is actually the final result because it's all done and everybody's billed all their time and we actually know the answer to this question. The, the first course is relatively expensive to open since all the XML transforms have to be written to take it, you know, instead of to paper or to standard HTML, to take it into the open format where we pull out all the references to how you contact the instructor and we pull out some of the high stakes assessments and things like that. Um, but subsequent courses cost less because once the transform is written, then you just process the courses not completely automatically, but largely automatically. So the first high school course that we opened cost about $5,000, and then after that we got the cost down to somewhere between $1,150 and $1,200 a course. It might go down a little bit more if we continued to do more of them, but I'm guessing somewhere between $1,100 and $1,200 per course is the, course, is the cost to open high school courses for BYU independent study. Um, to do university courses, uh, whose XML is apparently done a little better than the high school courses, uh, the cost ended up somewhere between $350 and $250 per course um, to take a course and open it. So this is basically including running the transform and a very, very, very quick sanity check to make sure that there's not uh, IP that we don't own that slipped into here, maybe six hours total worth of work to take a content complete course and get it openly licensed and put out in the open. Um, so that's the cost. That is what it actually costs. To date, in terms of conversion rates, you know, we're, we're trying to, 
One thing that's also interim about this report is that we're still trying to find different kinds of data or different ways that we can look at data to build arguments around whether we are or are not cannibalizing core business. Um, so of all the people who have come to the OCW site in the three months initially, 302 of them have converted into paying customers, which is just under 3%. Of those 300 people, 47 of them enrolled in one of the six courses uh, that it's being offered as part of the pilot. So the majority of them came, looked at the OCW courses, and then enrolled in some other class, not one of the ones in the open collection. Um, and 761 of them clicked on a button that says, boy, this class looks great. I'd like to take it for credit. 23 of those people actually completed that transaction. So 300 people altogether are paying customers through the OCW channel. 47 of those people in one of the six courses. And 23 of them actually did it by clicking on the, click, I'm going to click here to go enroll in this course right now. So in terms of estimating revenue, um, it's about it's about two to one in terms of high school courses to university courses because the beginning of summer is a time when high school students who don't want to go to summer school come enroll for courses in large batches and university people aren't enrolling anymore. But it's about two to one. And these are definitely estimations of, uh, of numbers, but they're close. So a high school course uh, costs $120 and a university course costs 430 That's about $67,000 in revenue the first three months if you look at this number or if you prefer something more conservative just the people who clicked on the click to enroll button and enrolled in one of the courses that we shared uh, 5100 in revenue in the first six months and I'll use the more conservative number in the in the rest of the slides so the, the core method we're using for asking the question about whether there's a decrease in enrollment or not, or whether there's going to be one, is an interrupted time series design. Um, and I'll talk about the equivalent control group in a second. Um, so basically using historical data for a control to look at what's happened before, look at the enrollment trend before we open the course, and then look at the enrollment trends after the course has been opened. And because enrollment is really seasonal, like May, June is always the biggest enrolling time for high school, we compare this May, June, July against last year's May, June, July because it has the most similar shape because this data, these data, or rather I should say, are seasonal. So this uh, cooking in the home course, the, uh, the blue line is the line last year. So this is... Uh, what would that be, 07? Well, this is summer of 08. Um, and you can see the, the line has a negative slope, a pretty s steep negative slope for this three month period of time. And the after, the after the course was open, this is the difference in the trend. Um, now I'm not gonna say anything about whether these differences in slope are really actually different, A, because we only have three data points, and B, because there are statistical tests to compare them and we haven't done them yet. But uh, in the test of interocular speculation, <laughs> these two slopes appear to be different to, to me. Um, for the personal finance course, um, you know, so this is the, sl the dotted line is the slope after and the solid line is the slope. So this is before we open the course and after we open the course. You know, the trend looks very similar. There is a difference in intercept, but this is the low enrolling course. Zero enrollments, one enrollment, two enrollments. So that's half a person, you know. Is that statistically significant difference in slope? I'm going to guess no. Um, the public speaking course. Um, before and after, you can see the um, the before slope is you know the is minus 10 here, and the after is only minus four. I doubt that's actually big enough that statistically it's going to be significant, especially with only three data points in it. We'll come back and look at it again later. But it, if there is a difference, it's a it's a positive difference. But I doubt there is one. I should have said that before too. Just let me come back to say. If there is a difference here, it's a difference in favor of the course after it was opened. Same thing here. Same thing here. 
although I'm not going to argue that there are statistically significant differences, but if there is a difference, it, it's a positive difference. David, sorry to ask, David, but Please. on the first slide, mm -hmm. the first of those, why is there such a dramatic difference with the first three? This one? Yeah. It's a huge difference. And in a cooking course, could you say people came looking for cooking stuff and found it? And you, you would think that you would, except the huge difference here, oh, because it's enrolling lower here, you mean, the first time? Um, yeah, by, uh, who knows? I, I if the economy stinks this year. All, all enrollments are down, generally, oh, okay. this year. Um, yeah, it makes it tough, tough year to do the comparison. Yeah, which is, which is particularly why we're doing a lot of uh, this year versus last year, and then I'll, I'll also show what might be a better measure in, in just a second in terms of the equivalent control groups. So in the high school courses, you see something a little different. So again, the dotted line is the line after. So now after it's been opened, this is trending down. Is it significant or not? You know, wouldn't really wager to say yet. Uh, same kind of trend, but it looks like maybe you know enrolling a little bit more after it's opened. This is a difference of about 20 students, difference in intercept. Um, and then this is uh, in Mott's class, you know, similar slope, but a decrease in enrollment, a drop in the in the intercept for this line. Significant, you know, I I, I don't know. So those, those are compar so those are the comparisons of the course at this time this year versus the same time last year. Now the next thing that we did was we went through and we've identified courses that for the last 12 months have had reasonably high correlations when enrollment in one course was up, enrollment in the other course was up, and when one was down, it was down for a 12-month period. And, th and these aren't standardized. So, you know, in some cases, you've got a course that enrolls 100 people correlating with a course that enrolls 10. But because they always move up and down together, they're, they're useful comparisons in terms of slope, not in terms of intercept. So this cooking class uh, correlates at 0.94, or has over the last 12 months with this history course. Uh, the, difference in inter the, the difference in how far up and down vertical, the intercept difference is kind of unimportant because we haven't standardized the scores. But you can see that the slope is basically the same, which would, which would argue that um, these two courses had very similar enrollment patterns before we opened one of them. We opened one of them, and they continue to have very similar enrollment patterns. Uh, the personal finance course, um, now the dotted and the solid got a little confused on a couple of these graphs, so I apologize. So this is the course that was opened, and this is the course that was not opened. Um, these correlated at 0.76 over the last 12 months before that. Um, there, there is a difference in these slopes in favor of the one that was opened, but it's a very small and rolling course, and again, who knows if this change is really significant or not. Uh, for the theater arts course, the, uh, the public speaking course, again, the difference in slopes is basically, I mean, there, there's not a big difference here. What these are telling us is that basically, for this course that you were highly correlated with before, after the opening, you've continued to be highly, there hasn't been any change in enrollment pattern, uh, no big change in enrollment pattern after we've opened the course. So I, I guess I've kind of beat these slides into the ground here. If I say intercept one more time, you'll probably kill me. So after three months, there appears to be, um, I mean, the, in the case of the university courses, maybe they're slightly up. In the case of the high school ones, maybe they're slightly down. But it, I'm guessing it's not going to be significant when we do come back around. I mean, we're talking about 302 total enrollments through this channel, um, 23 using the click to enroll button, out of 42,000 enrollments overall. So it's, a very, we're all, it's only six courses out of 600 um, that we're looking at. So it's kind of a, a very small sample anyway. But in terms of the question, does OCW publishing really threaten the financial viability of BYU independent study, the, looks preliminarily like the answer is no. I mean, the courses that we've opened aren't showing really any difference in the way they've enrolled compared to themselves in years past or compared to highly correlated courses now. Um, 
So if the answer to that question is no, then we get to ask, could this actually be done in a sustainable and larger scale way over the long term? So if we take the last three months and project them forward a little bit, which is a questionable activity, I understand, but I'm going to do it anyway. So if it's, if it's about, um, if it's 23, say approximately 25 click to enroll in a three month period, then it's about 100 a year, um, which would be 22,000 in revenue through that channel for just the, for six courses. In, in OCW. Now, I'm, this is using the conservative number, not the 302 that enrolled through the OCW channel, just the ones that explicitly said in the OCW site, I love this course, I want to enroll in it, I'm clicking on the button and I'm, I'm taking it. This is, this is the most conservative scenario. So based on six courses, it's about 100 people a year, about 22,000 in revenue. Um, thinking about sustainability, if one university course going forward is going to cost about $250 to open and the university courses, each one is doing, is about, has done, each one's done three enrollments in the last three months, so maybe 10 over the course of a year, then it's 4300 in revenue compared to 250 to open. And on the high school side, the high school courses are more expensive to open. Uh, but there's a, the cost is much lower. It's only $120 per course instead of 430 So more expensive to open, more enrollments, but lower revenue. 2400 in revenue per year on 20 enrollments. So BYU Independent Study hasn't been very willing to talk about what their margin is, which I have no complaints about. I think it's awesome that we're getting to do this study at all, so I'm not going to be critical. But if we just assume a 10% margin, then basically at the end of the first year, you're up $180 on your university course. And at the end of the first year, you're down 910 on the high school course. The other way of looking at that is the year, the number of years to recoup the cost of opening that course is the university course pays for itself within a year. The high school course takes about five years to pay for itself. Um, so the answer, could this be an ongoing, sustainable, uh, something we could do forever and ever with no, we haven't had any outside grant funding for it yet. If we never got a dollar of outside grant funding, could we do this forever and ever? The answer is, I think we probably could. Um, I think, I really think we could on the university side. Uh, the question of high school will be an interesting one to watch as more data come in. And you could say for every five of these you do, you get to do one of these and break even. There are a bunch of different ways you could look at it. Or you could say, oh my gosh, 900 bucks. I mean, we'll just throw that in the marketing budget, call it advertising. It'll be the cheapest advertising we do in any channel, and that's how we'll account for it. Um, anyway, I think, I think this can be done sustainably without a lot of grant money and without having to completely redo the way you do things. This just become, would become part of, uh, of the way we publish and think about that. And I think that's the end of the talk. Slides are here. My contact's here. Justin's is here. So any cool? <laughs> OK, we'll just go left to right since you all went up at exactly the same time. Mm -hmm. the content, but I didn't see that there was an increase either. No. So therefore, if you hadn't had it, they would have had that number of registrations anyway. There's, there, I don't think there will be a statistically significant increase in registrations, but when it only costs $250 to open a course and you only need two or three registrations to pay for it out of 135,000 or 150,000 registrations in a year, you don't actually need a statistically significant increase in enrollment for it to pay for itself. And I, I, I think that's what we're seeing. Transfer money and you want to say, well, we're going to attribute that number of registrations to this Mm -hmm. area to make it sustainable, mm -hmm. you probably would need to demonstrate that there were new registrations for us, and that's how mm -hmm. you annex that money. Yeah, and I, I think the argument there is if somebody's on the open courseware site and they click the button that says, I love this course, I want to enroll in it, and they click that button and they enroll in the course, then we can attribute that registration to the existence of the OCW site. Now, only 23 of those 
in a three month period against 40,000 isn't significant, but it, it doesn't need to be significant. It's enough for it to pay for itself. So the question is, do you believe a person coming, looking at the course in the OCW site, clicking the I want to enroll in this course button, can you really attribute that enrollment to the existence of the OCW site yeah, that's, that's is, is something you can argue. Yeah. So I think there's probably a good opportunity for a master's follow up here to go out and survey a bunch of these people or, or something like that. But that's, that's not something that we're planning on doing for this study. Quick interjection from the internet. Um, if you could repeat the questions really quickly or summarize them. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So the first question was, are you full of it, Dave? <laughs> I, I, th I think. I think so. Yeah. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Jane Anderson, Department of Education and Training, Sydney, New South Wales. Um, thank you for such an interesting presentation. It's given me a lot to think about. Um, one of the things that comes to me, first of all, is um, the potential learners that did come to your site. I'd really like to know why some of them went through, uh, mm -hmm. well, why some of them didn't. I'd really love to see some sort of survey or um, yeah. some further work done around that, I think it would be really, really illuminating. Uh -huh. um, to be perfectly honest, I think the, um, well, let me just say, I, I don't know any other dissertation at the university that's being talked about by the Vice President's Council, everybody waiting with bated breath to find out what the answer to it is going to be. Um, and until we know the financial impact of this and know it with some certainty, all the other questions are on hold. So we have started planning, like, so I made reference to one, an, an upcoming probably a, a master's thesis around surveying people to find out some things. There's another student with a master's thesis starting on the same data, looking at people that came through the click to enroll channel to see if they drop out at a lower rate since they had a good quality preview of it. So there are some other kind of studies queued up behind this one. Um, but the outcome of this study will have a lot to do with if there's ever another course opened or if these courses that have been opened even stay up long term or whatever. So, so I share your interest in some more of the non-financial detail, but this, the financial piece of it is definitely our top priority. Definitely. Okay, coming ac across this way. Sorry, Dave, not you. You're like number eight or something. Um, We're about eight minutes away from being able to answer your question by my judgment. Yeah. Um, not afraid. Take a really long time asking that question. Um, uh, Louise is our, I'm sorry, Louise, my voice, uh, in services, uh, this goes well, I can't, but I, I guess I'm just thinking, it, it's kind of early days to be making the decision that, no, this won't be cannibalizing the, you know, the other. Mm -hmm. uh, that was all the... So it's, your comment is it's early days, and that's what the first slide's about. This is interim. It's very early. There's only three data points. I, I guess. But. I, no, I, I sort of I understand that. But I mean, is there, the, the more students will find out and stuff like that. But I mean, will, will, will um, from the open side, will there be more marketing efforts or anything like that that will also sort of potentially have an extra impact or, or any of do you know what I mean? Like right now, I don't know what you guys are doing to get students enrolling now, but will that yeah. change as well? Yeah, so the questions around marketing and how different, I think, how different marketing might affect enrollment patterns and things like that in the future. Um, so, what the, to answer the question, what we're doing to get people to the site right now, um, we haven't joined the OCW consortium. We haven't advertised anywhere in any format, even on BYU's own homepage, about the existence of the project. If you come to the independent study website, there's a badge on there that says, check out these OCW courses we offer. So that, that, that badge, plus some mentions on my blog, is literally the sum total of advertising that's been done, and it's a little over 11,000 total visits to the OCW site in, in three months. Um, if the results are positive, that will change, but there is very much a caution of um, we're not sure what this is really going to do and we don't want to go screaming to the whole world about it. Um, if it might be that we're going to turn this whole thing off in five months, if it turns out to be a total disaster. 
And so to me, that gives us some generalizability problems. Like for other schools that belong to OCW Consortium and advertise about their open courseware site and other things, but it's just the way it, it's just the way it worked. I'm, I don't know if this is a question or a comment, but what I'm wondering is, uh, had your university courses been uh, from programs of study or connected to credentialing, I'm wondering what impact that would have had on, your, on the results of the data you've collected so far. Because it looks like the courses you've opened on the university side are of, we call community development interest, mm -hmm. so finance, home cooking, right. are not connected to people, you know, completing a program of study or a degree of some kind. Picked up on that, did you? <laughs> um, so yes, I, all the things you said are true. Um, the highest enrolling time for university courses historically is August and September, so we're just about to watch that bump in enrollment happen. It hasn't happened yet as of this data. Um, and again, so that selection of courses is um, very purposive to not bet the farm on this little pilot that we have no idea how it's going to go. Except that your, your student pool might be heavily biased towards a group that is looking for information mm -hmm. and is already less concerned about mm -hmm. some kind of official, you know, I completed this program yeah. kind of yeah, yeah. I mean, in some ways, like the selection of something like cooking in the home is absolute worst case scenario, right? Who needs credit for cooking in the home, right? So if we can show over a six or some number of month period of time that after opening a course like cooking in the home, paying enrollments don't drop off, then we've really, really done something, right? But at the same time, it's not... It's not a course that's so important in the grand scheme of things that we've we've bet the farm on this little pilot study. And I don't mean that to belittle the course or the the instructor, but it, it's not algebra one or you know one of the kinds of courses that you're talking about. David, David it's your wife. She said she wants you to take cooking in the home. Oh yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, see the problem is I do cook in the home sometimes, but I really need to take cooking in the home. So she doubly wants me to. Yeah. So my question is, is about what you mean by open, especially since you said BYU owns the IP. Mm -hmm. And it's related to the other part of sustainability, which is if you had some competition, if somebody took your courseware and offered a class, I don't see how they could offer a high school class for less than 120, but they might be able to offer the university class for less than 430. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of that is, do you really have classes run that have two or three people in them? You don't cancel them. Two, two, and two and three enrollments a month. Yeah. Oh, per month. Yeah, okay. yeah. Th those are those are per month numbers. It's rolling. It's, it's rolling enrollment. There's negative margins on that. Class. You would you would think so. Yeah, and some of those. And when I say the numbers are roughly 300 high school and roughly 300 university, and you think to yourself, Dave, just count the courses and tell me how many they are. It's because new courses come on, old courses get turned off. There, there is some flux in what continues to be offered. What gets retired, um, you know, th things like that. Uh, but repeat the first part of your question again. If someone is, could another private or public school take your material, teach the class, offer it for $200 instead of 430 uh -huh. and take customers away from you? Yes, that is totally theoretically possible. Absolutely. Last question, All right, Dave. <laughs> I, have, I have actually two on-topic very, very nope. questions. Nope. Darcy said question. Last question. Oh, the first one is, <laughs> how, how easy is it to actually enroll? Have you got the technology sorted out so it's just, ta-da, click, done? Or is now, it a complicated thing? It, it's exactly the same path to register as a person that's registering for a normal that's going through the normal registration process. The only difference is when you click on that click to enroll button, it writes a cookie to your browser before it puts you through the standard registration process. So it's no easier or harder than registering for any other BYU independent study the course. The is how serious has the conversation been with the marketing department? Are they actually thinking that they could do this or is that speculation on your part? Because I think that that's probably the most, the easiest, I understand this in the VP's office, but uh -huh. it's the easiest path in my mind towards the simple funding to get mm -hmm. this stuff done is the marketing for, for the ones that are going to cost money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I would say it's more, spec it's more 
hypothesizing than anything else. Okay. But I know they spend a whole it's lot of all. money, yeah. yeah, you know, advertising. Um, so I, 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 I would guess that you could open 50 courses a year at $900 cost or something, and it would be rounding error or, or, or something in the budget, yeah. But that's total speculation on my part. I don't have any idea what their budget actually is. Um, Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk in the hallway or anything else. Thank you for sitting through so many graphs and charts and other things.